thank, thank you, Liz, for inviting me. Thank, thank you for the very nice introduction. <clears throat> it's really a pleasure for me to be here. I have been, I mean, my entire life in a very close relationship with many countries in, in Africa. And uh, it's really a pleasure to, to, uh, to share with you some of my experience. Actually, I am tempted after uh, Fumla presentation to discuss what, uh, what could we do in Africa? I mean, what you could do in Africa, because the problems that you face are very similar to what we face in Brazil. Uh, although we have already uh, two big institutions that do produce vaccines for a long time, 120 years now, and those are the Butantan Institute and Fiocruz. We do produce vaccines, but there are a lot of things to do in development and, uh, and also how we, <clears throat> we can cross the valley of death when we try to develop something that is particular to our country. And um, I think uh, David Ketterer was... Uh, um, very sharp when he said, uh, I think that we should develop, but uh, we have to develop something and not depend completely on outside world. That means on, on the, uh, on Gavi or whatever. So I, I really think that you have to find a way to collaborate between countries and find a market that is the, um, the African market that you could really produce vaccines because one country only it will be difficult to produce that would be economically active since, uh, I mean, there are those big factors that produce large amounts. It would not be economically uh, soundable if you don't agree uh, and try to organize yourselves. I'm, I'm sure that help, money, finances, will, and technology will come from outside if you can get organized yourselves. And I really <clears throat> would like to, you to push you to think about this. Uh, what I prepared to you today, I, I saw the program and uh, I saw that I was, I was supposed to be the only one to talk about the COVID vaccines, but uh, George Schaffer did a wonderful job and she presented beautifully the, um, this, uh, the landscape of, of you have of, of these vaccines. But I'll try anyway to go a little bit over what she did and also de do something talk to you something, what we are doing in our laboratory and what are the thoughts that you think that you can still contribute to, um, to, a, um, to a vaccine. You know, we have many vaccines already, but those are the first vaccines to come. They are not the best vaccines we know. We'll need several generations of vaccines in order to have one that will stay. And that's why the, uh, the run is not finished and we have to continue running. So let's go again to demonology and, uh, and stop a little bit of politics, but I'd love to discuss with you. Uh, so the, uh, we know that when the virus enter in the body, the first response is innate response. And we know that interferon is the, perhaps the most important uh, to fight the virus. And we know also that the viral load is important. And, uh, and sometimes people that have a low viral load can uh, get rid of the, uh, of the virus by just producing high amounts of interference. Although we know that um, this disease also uh, damps, uh, damper a little bit the, uh, the production of, uh, uh, of interference. So normally with not the common respiratory virus, interference would be enough. But with COVID many times it's not enough because you have a lower expression of interference that is caused by the virus itself. So this could account for why many of the kids don't have disease and then young adults neither, because they can get rid uh, of the virus by, by a very active innate response. But once the, um, the virus enter in the cell, then we, uh, and, and we have got infection, we have to take a, an adaptive response. And that's what we actually we do with vaccines. So with vaccines, we try to uh, give the, the possibility to the immune system to uh, view, view what are the targets of a good immune response without having disease. So I, I would like to remind you that the virus itself, uh, it comes from another species and it would not never uh, uh, infect a human cell, although there was these precise, precise um, uh, mutations in a particular site of this protein that, that's the one that binds to, to, to human cells, 
that's the spike protein, as Georgia said. And the spike protein, there is one particular area called the RVD for receptor binding domain. And, uh, and this is the one that binds. Uh, and once it, it binds, there is a protease that cuts S in S1, S2, and then you enter, I mean, the virus enters the cell and releases a, a big, a huge uh, uh, RNA that produces 36 different proteins that uh, use, will <coughs> uh, produce new, new virus particles that will uh, then uh, be discharged by uh, pyroptosis of the cell. So we have actually two ways of fighting a virus. We either fight the virus by hampering the virus to bind the, uh, the receptor. And this is essentially the role of neutralizing antibodies. Or the second way would be to kill cells that have been infected in order to uh, stop virus proliferation. So we have these two. And uh, so when we think in, in, a, in a vaccine, uh, in the past, people only thought only in uh, neutralizing antibodies. But we do know now that it's very important to have also cytotoxic T cells to help and clearing the cells that are infected. And for both, we need a T cell response against uh, also of T, T, a CD4 response uh, to help all in all these tasks. So that's what we have to do when we think in a vaccine. So when you, again, when you take the uh, immune response, uh, the B cells recognized directly by the receptor, actually uh, the membrane IgMs, the, the virus, and uh, start producing. And uh, the T helper cell would recognize the antigen presented by HLA class two molecules in humans. So the, the response can vary from person to person because the different HLA that are very polymorphic would present differently uh, the peptides. And uh, this helper cell will help B cells to uh, produce, but also a precursor of T cells that they will recognize infected cells by recognition of class one molecules that present antigens. So, and though those are the compartments that will stay in the, uh, in the memory. And that's what we are trying to do whenever we do a vaccine. Um, when, but what would be, what would be a um, ideal vaccine? So ideal vaccine would have antibody response and T-cell responses. And then you have to have an antigen that's actually the target. And, and then you have to use either an adjuvant or a vector or whatever that will deliver the antigen to the immune system in order to produce the two uh, effector arms that you, you may have of the immune response. But how, how do you get there? So, so far, people uh, took the virus. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And here in blue is the, uh, <clears throat> in, is the spike protein. So the uh, people said, well, we can use inactivated virus, which so just you produce large amounts of virus, you inactivate either by irradiation, a chemical product, whatever, and you have already the vaccine. Those vaccines exist for a very long time. Uh, this is the case of the Salk uh, polyvi polyvirus vaccine, for instance. Those are old vaccines. They don't trigger a very strong uh, immune response. They don't work very well in elderly people, but they do work when all we know that they work. And then you can use, they have other uh, approaches. All the approaches that reach phase three and are currently being used in the world are either inactivated or somehow uh, introduced in the body the, uh, the spike protein, as George has said. And, uh, and, the spike, and the spike protein uh, is a large protein. It's a, there, it's, uh, there are three, uh, three valents, and it has three RBDs. You cannot see, it's very small here. And this is this, the, uh, and here is represented also the RBD. And this is where we're targeting. So actually, what we target is are neutralizing antibodies, either to RBD, there's some antibodies against the terminal end of the uh, spike protein that could play a role by allosteric hindrance of the sites of binding. 
but all the other antibodies are useless because the other antibodies could be even a problem because you have the problem of enhancement that you can find in dengue that probably will be uh, approached after my talk. Uh, so the, the, the problem of dengue is that antibodies that do not uh, neutralize the virus can allow the virus to enter the cell uh, because the antibody can fix to the FC receptor of uh, phagocytes and, the, and, and then the virus enter and replicates. So what, what you want, you want antibodies against RBD and have, you want cytotoxic T cells. When the people, why the people, I mean, they did all their bet on these, um, <clears throat> this protein. It's because they knew from SARS-CoV that happened in, 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 in China in 2002 that uh, this spike protein was the one that would stick to the cell. So when you look at the cells that are in the market now, you can see that, uh, I mean, the Chinese people did a lot of uh, efforts. They developed four different inactivated virus uh, vaccines. And there, there is also Bharat in India. So as I mentioned to you, it's just, I mean, uh, cultivating the virus, and purifying and doing an adjuvant. So the one that Brazil negotiated is Sinovac or Coronavac. So this was tested in Brazil and elsewhere. In Brazil, they tested with uh, healthcare uh, workers and the overall protection was 50% only. Um, of, uh, of the people of not having disease, but also it protected against moderate disease at 78% after two doses. Is this important? Well, this is not the best vaccine, but it's important because at least it avoids a good part of the people to get serious disease. And that's the problem that we have because our hospitals are overloaded and cannot manage all these people. So this is one of the vaccines that we are have in Brazil. It was uh, tested here. It was tested also elsewhere. And there are these other vaccines. On the other hand, India started using in emergency use the uh, Bharat vaccine without having a phase three, cl phase three clinical trial. <clears throat> so uh, Coronavac did phase three clinical trial in Brazil, but at start using without having phase three, now they are finishing phase three and they want to uh, deliver this vaccine everywhere. Oh, these, these vaccines are pretty easy to produce. They are not very technological. They are not expensive to produce either. And, um, and I don't know uh, what would be, uh, uh, what they're going to be um, to offer to Africa. Probably there may, Probably some of these vaccines will be offered by to Africa through the uh, uh, COVAX consortium or, or other ways of, from that work with Gavi. So another way of doing the vaccine is using, as I said, the spike uh, protein. Here is the spike gene that was inserted in genome of uh, adenovirus, and then the the, uh, the uh, spike is, is expressed on the virus, and this is the vaccine. And there are many vaccines that use this this platform. Actually, those are platforms that are being used for other purposes. And when the, uh, when the uh, COVID started, people just you know, switched uh, whatever they were doing to, uh, to the uh, coronavirus uh, protein uh, virus. So this is the fame. Here we have the famous University of Oxford or AstraZeneca vaccine that uses a chimpanzee that express, uh, ex express the spike. So these uh, vaccines have very uh, weird results. When they tested, they tested in Brazil and, and Britain. And there was someone in Britain that did uh, the vaccine and didn't count the amount of particles of virus in, as the, they should have done. So they're part of the people that receive as first dose, just half of the amount of virus. And then a second dose that was the, the, uh, the full dose. While in Brazil, they, had, they got full doses in the first and second injection. And uh, what, what was found is that in Brazilian testing, the overall protection was just 62%, while the one that used a, a smaller dose and then a, a, a stronger dose, they had up to 90%, although this was a much less number of people. But this brought a lot of confusion, and still there are a lot of confusion about this vaccine. And as you know, when this vaccine was tested in South Africa, the efficacy for not having disease dropped to 20%. 
but although I think that um, it could uh, it could uh, avoid very uh, moderate to uh, to serious disease. So this is a vaccine that is producing very large amounts in China, in India, in many other places. Uh, it could be a, a good choice for for Brazil, for Africa, etc. We have this problem that it doesn't work very well with those um, uh, those variants that you have in Africa and we have also in Brazil. We have the uh, South Africa uh, uh, variant plus the Manaus variant. And then other, other, other vaccines that use the same principle, we have the Janssen vaccine, for instance, that uses AD, the adenovirus 26 from human. And uh, with just one dose, it gives a overall protection of around 65%. That's what the uh, most of these vaccines actually do. Um, I mean, the, if you use these uh, denovirus, around 65% uh, uh, of having a moderate and severe disease. So the endpoints of each of one of these studies is quite different. And people from different countries that will buy those vaccines have to pay attention how the phase three clinical trial was performed. I, I I cannot go too much in detail, but I am part of DSMB. That's the uh, the um, <clears throat> the committee that sees the of, of, overall all the vaccines being tested in the United States. So I'm part of this uh, group of people. We so we oversee all the uh, these tests, and I can tell you just in general that the people, I mean, the uh, endpoints of these different vaccines are quite different. So we have to pay attention to what we say. Uh, another vaccine that's important is the CanSino from uh, China that uses adenovirus 5. And then the Russian vaccine that, uh, in my opinion, was this people from Galilea were the smarter one. We know that when you use adenovirus vaccines, the first shot, uh, uh, you, you develop a, a, an uh, <coughs> immune response against the, uh, the target uh, that means the antigen of the virus, but also against the virus itself. So you should not use in the boost the same virus that's what's happening in the Oxford. So they, these, these guys use the adenovirus 26 as first shot, and the second shot is adenovirus 5, and they had beautiful uh, response. They had a, a, a protection up that goes up to 90% at least with the uh, of the, vi the, begin the virus of the beginning. Now we don't know what's going to happen with the variants. Uh, we were struggled and really surprised when we saw all this data on the RNA vaccine. You know, the RNA vaccines are a promise for many, many years. It has been impossible to use RNA, neither for vaccines nor for other uh, medicines. RNA itself is a trigger of the innate immunity. Every, every, every time that we inject, RNA, you have a very strong inflammatory response, but there are many, much work that has been done. And uh, they, they, <clears throat> people were able to produce the RNA that, uh, that uh, has the, uh, the information on the spike protein. And then you have some elongations of the RNA that stabilize it. It renders less inflammatory and you can put in a nanoparticle inject. And those are the vaccines of Moderna and Pfizer that are very, very similar one to the other, and they have been tested. They were the ones, the, the first ones to have a result of phase three clinical trial, um, both Pfizer and Moderna, and with the advantage that uh, they have included elderly people, and we know that um, they also work with elderly people. So Pfizer and Moderna have around 94, 95% uh, of protection overall, and they work uh, with elderly on 88, 89% basis. They do also uh, uh, fall down in the efficacy when you test with the, um, with the uh, South African variant and they are working in preparing an, another, both are working on another vaccine that probably would have uh, uh, the different variants in the same uh, preparation. Uh, it, it's amazing how Moderna was quick. So by the time that we had the, uh, the amino acid sequence um, of the um, of the uh, of the protein, the spike protein, they took only sixty days to produce the vaccine, test it in in mice and and, and non-human primates 
do all the paperwork, producing good manufacturer practice and ship to start the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the clinical trials. It's amazing how science was very quick. But uh, we have to uh, understand also that the US government through the uh, warp speed, they provided money to these companies. So they actually gave $2 billion for each of the five companies that were had more chances of reaching the results. And this was done also in uh, NIH, not only at Moderna. And then you have the Novavax. Novavax is just a, a, the spike protein produced by uh, recombinant DNA, and then it, it produces a, D, a VLP. They have a very good uh, adjuvant, that's the Matrix M1. Uh, they had good responses in, in, in Britain. Uh, it was uh, something like 90%, even though they have already the variant in Britain. Uh, uh, but when it came to South Africa, the results were less than 50% when, uh, when v, uh, HIV uh, volunteers were included when they didn't took in, take in, in account the uh, HIV patients, the uh, <clears throat> protection was something like 60%. So again, we have the same problem. So these variants, we have the, the, the British variant that uh, <clears throat> uh, is active with uh, uh, children, 24% more infectious to children and have we have all these other variants, including the South African, the Brazilian, and so on. Most of them that are important are here at the RBD. Perhaps the most important is this E4044K and the N5501Y. So these variants are terrible because neutralizing antibodies do not act against them. Not all the neutralize, not, not all the neutralized antibodies, but neutralized antibodies that have this as a target, they don't work. And that's why it falls down so quickly the um, the uh, <clears throat> the the tighter of an neutralized antibodies. There are some uh, some mutations at NTD level that could be important. And the Brazilian mutation here creates an, a, a glycosylation site. And the glycosylation is a problem because it can um, hide the uh, RBD. Uh, well, uh, I cannot go into much in detail. It gives also more uh, stability to the protein. So this is a problem. So yeah, I don't need to tell you how, how it's important yeah, there in South Africa with the new, new variant and how it from the uh, end of September till now, it took completely the, um, the, the uh, uh, camp and all the, I mean, uh, Practically all the patients now have um, have this, this South African variant in South Africa. I'm not going to enter too much in detail. Neutralized antibodies suggest correlation efficacy, but they are not enough. And you can see that the ones that give very high uh, antibody titers are the ones that also that protect well. The ones that have lower titers are not that good, like the Brazilian, the China Brazilian. Uh, uh, CoronaVac and Oxford. Those are the two ones that we have in Brazil, unfortunately. And also against variants, I'm not going to go too much in detail. Uh, what we have tried to do in our lab is try to think different. Uh, we knew that people were, were going to do the inactivated and the spike. So we decided to study immune response. We had the cohort of 200, over 200 people that had disease and got rid of the virus, so they were protected and have studied neutralizing antibodies, IgG, IgAs, and how this uh, correlates with RBD. And, um, and uh, we know we also studied the neutralizing profile of the people. And we could say that at 40 days, some people would we could not detect. It's not that they didn't have, but you cannot detect neutralizing antibodies. The other have different titers, but this titer fall down after six months a lot. And that's why we decided that uh, that uh, we should, uh, I mean, design the the uh, the, uh, the vaccine differently. And first, we we did a lot of experiments on B cell responses against isolated peptides, isolated spike, isolated uh, RBDs, and finally we decided that uh, a dimer of RBD would be the best. Uh, antigen for is for triggering neutralizing antibodies 
And, uh, and then we decided to study the immune response. So by bioinformatics, he studied the 36 proteins. We have selected 66 pro uh, peptides that would be important for both TD4 and CD8 responses. Uh, we have tested in pool and individually all the different peptides. We have matched with the different HLA uh, serotypes in order to have a uh, immunodominant epitopes. And we have selected 20 epitopes at the end, 10 CD4s and 10 CD8s. And then we went to the choice of vector. We wanted to do a nasal uh, a vaccine. So we decided to do nanoparticles with Kutozana and also uh, VLPs. And those VLPs are, uh, they have a protection. They, uh, they were constructed in such a way that they are not destroyed in mucosal surfaces. So the idea would be to have intranasal immunization because you can trigger a good anti-RBD antibodies, IgG and especially IgA that are so important in mucosal, but also you would trigger a good response on T cells. Um, I cannot go into detail of our experiments. Oh, so this is, these are the advantages that I mentioned to you on the intranasal uh, route of administration. This is just one experiment. Uh, on the titers of antibodies. And here are the neutralizing antibodies. We can reach something like uh, one to uh, <clears throat> 11, uh, 12,000 uh, neutralizing titers. That's our very high titers. And, uh, and nowadays what we are doing is we are um, engineering the protein of these different peptides in RBD to be expressed in, 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 in uh, show cells for industrial production. And we are currently discussing if the uh, different uh, Brazilian pharmaceutical companies, which one was going to produce it. So the idea is to induce neutralizing antibodies and T CD4 and CD8 response, induce long, long memory, no serious adverse effects, have broad protection coverage in population, mucose and non-injectable administration, preferable single dose. This is being very difficult. Low production cost, it's really not, not cost at all, thermal stability. And it's important that it's completely master of productions technology by Brazilians. So if there is a new variant in Brazil, we can adapt. And actually the uh, last, uh, uh, the last um, antigen that we have produced, we have already included the different uh, features of the uh, South African and Brazilian uh, uh, variants. So we, we need to have in our region something that we can adapt ourselves and we don't have to rely if the Chinese or the uh, people in the United States are going to change the vaccine for a, a particular need that we have. Um, while this is happening, of course, people started vaccinating. And I would like to bring to your attention uh, that we all, I mean, we always miss it. So when you see the uh, Canada bought six times more vaccines they actually need, United States five times, United Kingdom four, four times, the European Union at least three times. Well, we don't have in uh, middle income and lower uh, middle income countries, we didn't buy enough vaccines and we have to rely on what is going to be exported. I am part of the COVAX initiative, uh, that is where the WHO, Gavi and SEPI try to discuss what are the best vaccines. And of course, we are discussing what could be the best vaccines to buy and send to Africa and South America. Well, these are the group that work with me and um, I'm not going to discuss too much on these, uh, these events, but uh, the number of events and observation time is a problem with all these vaccines. The effectiveness at different ages, minorities and risk groups also, we don't know enough as the population coverage and most of these vaccines work against disease, sometimes severity of disease, but we don't know if they're sterilized, so they don't allow people to transmit the virus even if they have been vaccinated. Production nostalgia capacity is a big problem for us and for you also in Africa. Distribution is also a problem and how we're going to prioritize everything. So this is what I wanted to bring to you for discussion. Perhaps I was too long but I want to bring these ideas to you. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, 
we may have some few minutes. Uh, we're gonna have a whole discussion panel in the end. Just uh, David had some technicalities and he was kicked out of his own meeting, but he's gonna be back uh, soon, I hope. And uh, if anybody has any questions for Dr. Khalil, please unmute and speak. Uh, Nobody, everybody's still shy. Um, I mean, uh, what I, I myself, there is a question here I'll read soon, but uh, what I, 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 I like to ask is, we saw all the types of vaccines and the difficulties and to, in order to implement and to produce, and some of the, some of the, the challenges are quite similar between the two continents, right? And uh, my question is how it can be uh, improved in this sense, how this challenge can be improved in order to move faster the, the vaccines from the bench, which is, for example, in your case, you have really these vaccines in a facility producing. Just paperwork is, uh, I know that the clinical trials will take long, but uh, it's, just the time for clinical trials, or we can uh, speed up the process in a certain way? Well, the, the, the problem that we face, uh, I would say, in Africa and Brazil is that even though we can have good scientists that will develop a new vaccine, a new product, how they are going to cross the valley of death, that we call, where you have to do actually the develop, development of the, the, the initial product in the industrial product that could be tested in humans and go to all these different phases of proof of concept and toxicity. And uh, so you, you would need uh, pilot plants and, uh, and ways of producing uh, uh, the cells in GMP condition and so on. And this is, in most of the cases, the good ideas are, are, are killed in that particular uh, way. And it's, it's very sorry. That's what may happen also in Brazil. I was fortunate, for instance, in the when I was at Butantan that I took this initial virus, um, in attenuated virus of dengue and bring to the phase three clinical trial. And that's very rare in our countries because they die before that. Thank you very much, George, for, for that. I just wanted to find out something from you regarding the results of uh, the so-called uh, South Africa. And I don't use that lightly because we don't talk about the China virus, but suddenly we have Brazil, British, South Africa variants, right? <laughs> now, when, when you look at that, did this um, vaccine actually fail or maybe the numbers are not enough to, to make that conclusion? Because it was only 2,000 and then there was a subset of the subset. Yes, well, that's a very important question. We, I mean, people are just starting to, uh, to see if the people that were vaccinated ha can have been infected by this new variant. Uh, I mean, this variant is still in the north of the country, it just uh, appeared more in the south where, uh, where uh, we live in Sao Paulo, where most of the science is done. And uh, there are many projects in this regard. Um, by, by just using neutralizing antibodies from the vaccinees, apparently there is a lower a lower uh, tighter, but what does that mean in real life? We have to check. Um, I'm afraid that they are not going to work that that well. But uh, what we I can tell you is that people that uh, I mean, talking to my colleagues in in Manaus, that there are many reinfection cases. I mean, people that got immunity after the first time they got disease they have been reinfected in this outbreak that we're facing now in Manaus. That's very bad. That means that uh, people that actually got disease and got rid of the, uh, of the virus and had a good immune response uh, were unable to uh, hamper the uh, uh, reinfection. And there are many, many cases. Okay. Um, um, Luis, did you take uh, Prof. Nyazema's question? Because there's a hand up. No, you can take, please. I was okay. about... Uh, Okay. Okay. Can, uh, can we have a quick question then from Prof. Nizim? Norman? Yeah, my, my th thanks a lot, um, David. My question to Prof. Um, Khalil is, it seems like not many people discuss the pros and cons 
of the different types of adjuvants that are being used for these for the different um, for the different vaccines. Surely, some of the effic issues concerning efficacy will be associated with the different types of adjuvants. What's your comment to that? I completely agree. Uh, what people, I think that most people are doing in order to don't have many issues on uh, regulatory issues, they are using um, uh, <clears throat> adjuvants that have already been tested and approved in humans in order to get a quick approval, I think. And uh, that's bad because there are ma so many uh, proposals of new adjuvants that could work very well. And, uh, and I think this is very important for sure. Okay, thank you.